All right, let's turn to the book of Obadiah, the book of Obadiah right there after the book of Amos, right before Jonah. And as we get into it this evening for the last installment of our study of this wonderful uh, little book of prophecy and also of uh, just speaking for God. I love how uh, Obadiah makes it very clear, thus saith the Lord. And so this is from God in presentation. If you need an outline, we'd love for you to have one. Uh, Brother Cliff's going to make his way down the middle aisle. If you need an outline, just kind of get his attention. And uh, we'd love for you to take one, fill it out along with us as we move through this book. We'll cover a lot of verses tonight. And uh, so we're going to jump right in here in just a moment. But you get Brother Cliff's attention as he makes his way to the back and grab one of the outlines. We certainly would love for you to follow along. Uh, in Obadiah, what we, have, what we have seen thus far, and you see it there on the outline that you have in the Roman numeral number one, we've looked at these main characters, uh, each playing a prominent part in here. Obviously, Obadiah being the author, the messenger, the voice of the Lord in this case, the mouthpiece, and then obviously with Israel and Edom both playing uh, a huge part in this letter and uh, this book as we have seen. And so uh, we talked about then also, again, this is just review so we're going to do it very quickly about the family feud as we've studied these verses in the old testament they've laid out clearly the animosity the uh the the feud-like relationship between israel and edom and uh, both being uh, family and uh, so forth related one to another and so we talked about bitterness the devastation that that bitterness brings that edom certainly embraced we we talked about how you can defeat bitterness, and that's bitterness over injustices and inequalities. We talked and made some personal application in that way. And uh, then uh, notice we moved on, and so we saw, okay, what is the cause of Edom's judgment? What is the cause of it? And last week we saw letter A here, uh, that how they stood by on the other side and uh, while Israel was being attacked. We saw that in verse number uh, 11 and following, how that they uh, were attacked, and or excuse me, they stood by while uh, Israel Israel was attacked, uh, maybe the Babylonians, as we discussed, and things there. And so, uh, notice the statements that passive, uh, that the passive action on their part, and uh, as they, when they should have been comrades, they should have come to the aid of Israel. They did not. Now, w one of the important parts of this review is this: we will come to see that every area and every way in which Edom had treated Israel wrong, God kind of brings it back on them. God kind of turn it back. In fact, let, let's just do this. Uh, share with you a verse. Look at verse number 15. We'll speak of it more and talk about it more. But look at verse number 15. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. Now, that's a great prophetical statement. It is bringing up the principle we've already seen that uh, as God has made clear throughout his word, you're, you're going to reap what you sow. And so it is here with Edom. As they've gone down this list and as they watched and these invaders and, and, and just descend upon Israel, and they just kind of stood by the side. They didn't think. Then secondly, you remember we noticed uh, they encouraged and rejoiced in that. Verse number, verse number 12, But thou shouldest not have looked on in the day of thy brother, the day that he became a stranger. Neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Israel and Judah in the day of their destruction. Neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. So we see them now not just being a passive in the sense of not, not responding. Now they see that Israel's being devastated, as we saw last week, and they're rejoicing in it. They're excited. They're enjoying, delighting in the, the misery of Israel, something no, no Christian ought to do. In fact, even God would expect it of humans not to do that. We saw, we saw and we made these points here. You see how God said repeated, thou shalt not. That. You shouldn't have done this. You shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have looked. shouldn't have rejoiced. Uh, and he goes on and look not, rejoice not, and glow not is how we kind of summed it up as God had told Edom you shouldn't have done that and and you did that in turn and one of the things that we brought out of this is Edom watched and enjoyed the fall of Israel absent was any thought of that being the just judgment for the Jews wickedness in their turning from God their heart attitude was all wrong remember last week how we compared that to David and we took some of those psalms where David said ah I wish this upon my enemy boy I I, I want this to happen then that righteous indignation and judgment from the hand of God and so conversely we see Edom and, and their attitude is all wrong from the heart it is wrong their desire for things to fall upon the head of their enemy is is an error and that comes from a, a wrong heart. And so we challenge ourselves in conclusion there. Let's make sure that we are not like the Edomites. 
in any way by relishing, rejoicing over, or gloating in the distress of our enemies as the product of a heart attitude that is self-serving. And we're going to see this come to play a little bit more. Tie in with their bitterness, some of their pride and their self-serving attitude even tonight. So let's move on. Let's look here. Verse number 14, if you will. Actually, verse 13. Let's back up. Verse 13. Notice he continues. What is the cause of their judgment? Verse 13. Here's their actions. Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in their day of their calamity. Three times over, God says calamity. Boy, this is a, a terrible time for Israel. And he said, uh-oh, now you've kind of taken it for a little further. In your bitterness and animosity against Israel, Edom, uh, here's a third cause for your judgment. Let her see. They participated and assisted in the spoiling of Israel. So in their bitterness and their great delight and rejoicing of what was happening to Israel, it wasn't enough to sit by the side and stand and watch and cheer the re, uh, invaders on while rejoicing over it. No, they came down from the hills. They descended from uh, their own land into Israel and they entered the gate. Their passive activity is now crossing over into more very active activity. They looked upon the calamity of the Jews and they helped themselves to the wealth of their brothers. God's condemning them and judging them. The judgment's going to fall because you, you kind of just lost right in. And many of them have been carried away. Others have been killed and the enemies have taken And you're, you're just going in and taking of the spoils. You're join, joining right in. Uh, their wrong attitudes of rejoicing led to the wrong actions of spoiling. Not only was there rejoicing and delight in the calamity of the Israelites, but now they're uh, participating. And I'll tell you right now, we'll see it tonight. This is going to come back to haunt them tremendously. They will, in ways that they would have never dreamed, they will reap what they have sown. As God says in verse 15, their, their reward's coming, and it is going to be much in the same as they have done, and so it will come upon them. Quickly, the fourth cause that follows quickly on the hills of that, verse number 14, look there. Neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those of his that did escape. Neither shouldest thou have delivered those up, uh, up those, excuse me, of his that did remain in the day of distress. My goodness, the fourth cause, we can put it here, letter D there, uh, they prevented the escape of some Jews. Did you see what was described here? You can imagine many Jews, as they saw, whether it be the Babylonians or the enemies descending upon Jerusalem and, and parts of Israel, they would load up their wagon or their chariot or whatever it may be, their horse, their mule, and uh, uh, their camel, and they would try to get out of there, get out of Dodge while the getting's good. And so they would try to run, they would try to leave and, and maybe gather their families. And what does Edom do as they saw the destruction fall? The Bible says they stood in the crossway and they prevented them. So they would have in turn caught them and brought them back to Babylonians or whoever for them to enslave or to kill. We also see the picture in the verse of the possibility that they went in there and uh, maybe found some in different places. And instead of helping them, sheltering them, uh, maybe uh, offering them uh, shelter in their own place. No, no, no. What they do is they turn them over. They give them to the attacking army, and if we put it this way, they, they proceeded and promoted the uh, imprisonment uh, and death of the Israelites. They promoted it. They proceeded to hand them over, and probably for a reward, we could imagine, a bounty, if we might describe it as that. And what does God say? Did you catch it again? This verse, like every other verse, thou shouldest not have. You've done wrong. You shouldn't have done that. You've done wrong. Some believe that many of the Jews probably tried to flee to Egypt. Obviously, Edom, as we saw on the map, uh, is to the south of Israel. And no doubt, many of the e uh, Israelites were trying to flee to get out of the, the land there and probably were trying to get to Egypt. And Edom was on the way, and they, they would not let them go. They prevented them. How sad. Could you imagine seeing the destruction of a city and those poor people who are escaping? And maybe, just maybe, they think they've escaped the hand of the Babylonians or whoever that enemy was in their own town. They came to a crossway. They came to the border there. And there's the Edomites. And they're thinking, oh, brothers. And the Edomites take them and return them to the invading army. It explains why in verse 10, God said, what about them? 
Well, your violence. You've been violent against thy brother. Now, let's make it a little practical, continue with the thought we've stu- we, we began these last couple weeks. That's what unchecked bitterness always leads to, isn't it? Violence. Violence with our words, violence with our thoughts, violence with our actions, violence displayed in many ways. I put it this way, bitterness is never satisfied. Bitterness is not satisfied with just seeing an enemy suffer. Someone who's bitter, they're not just satisfied with seeing that person suffer, no. And they're not satisfied with just rejoicing over it. If I have animosity or bitterness that I've entertained and allowed to grow in my heart, I'm not just satisfied with them suffering, and I'm not satisfied with just rejoicing over it, enjoying it. I'm not satisfied with reaping some of the benefit from their misfortune. As the Edomites descended and took of their spoils and their wealth, that, wealth, that didn't satisfy them. And may I just say what even this last verse points out, Bitterness isn't even satisfied when we participate in the hurt or the cause of another's calamity. You think of maybe your own childhood or uh, maybe your own children or even grandchildren. You see one child that gets hurt or uh, angry over something that an injustice and inequality as they perceive it in the family. And, and they want to take it out on the other guy and, and they want to make him pay and make him hurt. And, and they'll follow that same line. It, it isn't enough just to see uh, the brother suffer. It isn't enough just to rejoice over it. It isn't enough just that maybe you benefited from them. And, and uh, no, and it isn't even enough if you calls them hurt it never satisfies the bitterness see so many think of hey i I can just get them back if i can see them fall and make them pay and i i can have a hand in their demise then i'll feel better about it my friend bitterness is never satisfied and that's what edom's finding out and god is making crystal clear it is never satisfying so don't give it room don't let it grow don't give it a place in your heart, and your mind, and your life. Do not allow bitterness to take hold of you as the Edomites found. Your outline, we put it this way, bitterness is never satisfied. And in that discontentment, it will surely inflict a damage not just on others, but upon you. We've emphasized before the impact that it can have on those we influence. But my friend, it not only hurts them, it hurts you and I. If I entertain bitterness, it's going to create tremendous pain and hurt for me, damage in my life as I entertain bitterness. And boy, the Edomites are finding this out. God has promised, I'm going to cut you off. That's going to be the result, uh, the consequence of your choices and your actions. I find it interesting in the book that we've studied before, the book of Amos, right before this one. God also speaks through that prophet, Amos, and he talks about the Edomites, and he, he kind of sums up. Uh, uh, this really describes, if you, might, if you say, okay, describe for me uh, a person who is bitter and how that shows up. This is a great description. And God is speaking through Amos, and he's talking about the Edomites. He's talking about Edom, and he says this, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Edom, yea, and, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof. Because he did pursue his brother with the sword. Now, forgive me, but all I can picture is when one of my sons hits the other with a foam sword, and the one that got hit thinks it's too hard, what happens? Boy, roles are reversed. The one who got hit picks up the foam sword and chases the other one throughout the house. We're going to get even. I'm going to pursue them with the sword until, guess what? They're hurting like I'm hurting. Now, come on. Those of us who have brothers, we've been there. I'm going to make them hurt like I, and chase them. And that's literally what the picture is. Someone who's so mad, so angry, so bitter. Boy, I'm going to, if it's the last thing I do. You ever hear somebody say that? I'm going to get them back if it's the last thing I do. Be careful, pretty good indicator that someone has some bitterness somewhere. That pursues them with a sword. Notice he goes on. What a statement. And did cast off all Pity, mercy. I'm not going to show you mercy. I'm not going to show you any pity. The way you've acted, the way you've treated me, the injustice I have suffered, the inequalities that I have had to face, why should I show you pity? And God is saying, Edom has shown Israel absolutely no pity. They've cast it off. I don't have any pity on Israel. 
He goes on, notice these descriptions. And his anger did tear perpetually. Man, angry, just all the time, tearing at. I like it, at the idea of reaching out and hurting someone, tearing at them and with words and, and actions, just tearing at somebody and hurting, trying to cause pain. That is how Edom acted, and he goes on. And was pacified? No. When he saw Israel suffer, he was happy and content? No. What does it say? Kept his wrath forever. Forever. Now, my friend, I don't know about you, but that is definitely a pretty good description of a bitter soul. Of a bitter soul. We like to couch it in maybe uh, kinder terms, uh, maybe some terms that kind of as, as makes it feel a little better to our conscience. Be careful saying that, uh, talking about holding a grudge against somebody because that's just a good another name for bitterness. If you use some other terminology to describe your bitterness, be careful, be careful, because God takes that pretty serious. And here is Edom, and God says, listen, how you have acted, and notice what he says in this verse right here. Uh-uh, I'm not going to hold back the punishment. I'm not turn away the punishment that you deserve. Can I just encourage you tonight? May that never be said of us. As believers, may that never be said of us and how we treat someone and how our response is, no matter the injustices, the inequalities, no matter how things are, are put or how we are treated, the fact that we would show no pity, that we would tear at somebody with our teeth and our words, that we would hang on to our wrath. You see, Edom as a nation is in a terrible position right here. They're that, that bitter person that's never happy, full of anger and always full of animosity. And it, that bitterness has moved them to commit these atrocious acts upon those who God says are your brothers. God says, I'm not going to let it go unpunished. Now we go back to the beginning of the book, and this is where God actually begins, and he, he starts with explaining the judgment that's going to come. So we kind of looked at it in, the, in reverse. We looked at this passage to see, okay, what was the cause of the judgment? Then let's look now at the content of the judgment, okay? What, what makes up this judgment? He starts right away with verse number one. The vision of Obadiah, thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a rumor from the Lord. And an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Arise ye, and let us rise up against her in battle. Now, you think about this. This is a, this is a great statement, because what is happening here? Well, if there was one thing that we have garnered so far from this little book in our study of the relationship between Edom and Israel, it's that God very much views Edom's treatment of Israel as a form of betrayal family betrayal they truly betrayed israel in a horrible fashion enjoying and relishing the thought of israel's suffering well again god is going to see fit that they reap what they sow and here he is describing what that's going to look like in verse number one we see the first description of this they too will be betrayed they too will be betrayed. God is telling through Obadiah, he's telling, listen, there's been an ambassador that has been sent out. And this ambassador is going around to those countries that you think are your friends, are your allies. Many think the ambassador was sent out from Babylon and uh, uh, to go out and to communicate with the other allied. We saw in Psalms some of the countries that Edom was uh, in a confederacy with. And so... He's saying, listen, there's, there's been an ambassador sent out, and they're visiting all these other nations, and they're getting everybody together to arise and bring the battle to your doorstep. You're going to be betrayed, God is saying. A betrayal by Edom's supposed allies and friends. See, the knife is going to be now stuck in Edom's back just as they stuck it in Israel's back. Look down at verse 7. He elaborates a little bit more. All the men of thy confederacy have brought thee even to the border. The men that were at peace with thee have deceived thee and prevailed against thee. They that eat thy bread have laid a wound under thee. There is none understanding in them. May I just put it this way in your outline. The confederacy, as it's termed here, is turning upon itself. Edom would be deceived. And did you catch that beautiful word picture in that verse? 
God is telling Edom, the very people that you've had sit at your table, the ones that you have sat around the table and feasted with, and they have eaten your bread, and they have fellowshiped with you, and, and you thought these were your friends, these, you thought they were like family to you, Edom, they're going to be the ones that bring a wound upon you. Isn't it amazing? And, and I'd have to say this. Isn't our God amazingly good in how he does cause people to reap what they sow? He does. I mean, it, it's pretty amazing if you think about it. God says, okay, you've done this. This is what's going to happen to you. And certainly in his sovereignty, he has allowed it, permitted it, even brought it about to happen on them. They are going to be betrayed. Look at verse number 2. Let's add something else. He says this, Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. Thou art greatly despised. <laughs> now here they are. They thought they were, everything's going hunky-dory, man. Israel's getting defeated. Everything's wonderful. Now we can maybe take some of their land where, man, our, our arch enemy has been defeated and gone and bad. And this is wonderful. And God says, hang on. You despise them. Guess what? You too are going to be despised. Again, by the very nations and people who you thought were your friends and your allies, they're going to despise you. We already established how God has condemned the Edomites' great animosity and despising of Israel. That verse in Amos describes how much they despised them. No pity. Their anger uh, perpetually tearing them. Their wrath never given up towards them. Now God is saying, you're going to be greatly despised among the heathen. And he gets a little, you know, like, uh, a little, he kind of gets the sword in there and kind of twists it. How? Well, he makes this point. He says this, I'm going to make you small among the heathen. See, you think you have arrived, little Edom. You, you think you have, uh, on, the, uh, on the, basically the backs of Israel, you now have arrived in the Confederacy. You're at the table with the other big nations. No, no, no. I'm going to make you small. And that's what he uh, even alludes to, verse number three, if you, if you look ahead. He talks about the pride of thine heart. And here's an issue. Here's one of the main problems with Edom. Not only were they bitter, but they had a pride about them, a, pride, a, a, a proudness of heart that God had to deal with, that, that God wanted to say, this isn't right. It was a big hit to their, their pride. They had worked so hard to get a seat at the table among the great heathen nations, yet it was all for naught. They wanted to be viewed as a major player in the international scene, as a big player. They wanted to be one of the other great countries. And God said, no, 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 I'm going to reduce you. I'm going to make you small. And what happens? Already he said, listen, the other nation is going to turn on you. They're all going to get together, and they're going to come and attack you and, and make, lay, you, lay waste to you. You're small. You are nothing in their eyes. Now let me ask you this. If you and I were to ask the Edomites, before Israel and Jerusalem fell, how would they have described how Israel was in their sight? Nothing. Small. Worthless. It's funny, isn't it? How God knows well the heart. And he brings that same attitude and spirit that we might show and we don't repent of, boy, he brings it to bear on us sometimes, doesn't it? He exposes it and shows, wait a second, here, here's reality. I just put it this way, this is what God is getting at. And I hope you don't miss this tonight because I think these things really do go hand in hand so much. Let me put it this way. Pride and bitterness are a dangerous duo and often walk hand in hand. Pride and bitterness are a dangerous duo and they often walk hand in hand. And God is exposing that in Edom right now. Now, furthermore, let me put it this way, and I think this bears pointing out. Prideful people aren't always bitter, but bitter people are almost always prideful. Think of that for a moment. Okay? So uh, these are a dangerous duo, and they often go hand in hand. Not so much as prideful people are, are always bitter. I don't believe that to be the case, nor do I find that in scriptures. But I do find this, and I believe it is provable and observable. Uh, easily observable is the reality that bitter people are all often always proud people they give in to pride pride hangs on to bitterness let me give you an illustration okay let's just say brother ron ruby's sitting in the first four rows so i get to pick on him. 
okay? That's the five pew rule, by the way. So just kidding. Most of you will move back after five rows. Anyway, okay, so Brother Ron Rupi, let's say Brother Ron Rupi does something to offend me. Somehow, some way. In fact, you know what? Him and Ernie made fun of me before the service, but I'm not going to go there. Okay, so let's say that he did something to offend me, okay? And he offended me in some way. Now listen, in my bitterness, if I, if I don't forgive him, which I believe biblically I can show you that it, all the impetus is on me to forgive him, there's impetus on him to make it right. But in my own co- microcosm, my world, my job, my heart before God is to let go of my bitterness my, and, and give him forgiveness. That's the first step. I ought to say, hey, love covers a multitude of sin. I love Brother Ron. Brother Ron Ron loves me. You know what? It's forgiven. It's gone. That ought to be the attitude. That ought to be the spear. That ought to be the response here that that is there. But let's just say it isn't, okay? Let's just say that I'm holding on to this. He's offended me in, in, in one way, and I'm not letting go of it. What happens is when I'm holding on to that bitterness and I'm letting anger turn up inside of me and I'm looking at Brother Ron and it's coloring all my view of him, you know what often creeps other than that? Well, that low-down scoundrel, I am such a better person than Ron Ruby. <laughs> I, I, I am, I'm telling you, he can only dream to be as good as I am, and how dare he say that? Now listen to me, okay? You know what happens? What feeds our bitterness? My pride. Whereas the opposite ought to be true. In our humility, it ought to be, Listen, I am nothing. So boy, whatever Ron says to me, it's not going to hit my pride. Because I know I'm nothing. The only way I'm something is because God has made me something. I'm something in Christ. So my pride is not going to get all all worked up and riled because I'm not proud about me. There's nothing to be proud about me. Listen, hey, have I ever made a mistake? Oh yeah, probably ten times as many as Ron has. So why should I get offended? Why should I allow the bitterness to... Isn't it amazing how much a humility can diffuse bitterness? A humble heart and a humble spirit. Uh, the Bible said, blessed are those who are, are in your spirit, you're weak, you're, you're poor in spirit is the idea that actually it's bankrupt as we've studied. You're bankrupt in your spirit. You, you realize I, I am bankrupt spiritually and I, I'm really nothing. And in humility, I say, wait a second, why should I get worked up? Why should I get bothered because he said something? My friend, listen, can I tell you, bitterness and pride, boy, they go hand in hand a lot. And pride is often the reason we don't let go of bitterness. I met a lot of bitter people, unfortunately. And I'll tell you, bitter pre- people are almost always wrestling with an issue of pride unwilling to let it go and you know what we're seeing in this passage god is exposing edom's pride oh he's already exposed their bitterness you don't show pity uh, your anger tears at them you don't let go of your wrath you're just that's how you're ain't full of animosity and hate towards israel now let's reveal the pride that is there so beware be observant Look at verse number three, if you will, with me quickly. He says, the pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. Huh, isn't that interesting? Always deceives us, makes us think that we should be mad because someone hurt me. We should be this. We deserve this. Boy, pride is very deceptive. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. Thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? Oh, I love this statement. (laughs) The pride is being exposed in their thinking and even in their words. They had stood by and rejoiced when Israel had met their demise, delighting and rejoicing over her devastation and destruction. And so God says this, all right, you rejoiced over them being brought low. We're gonna, I'm going to bring you low. You too will be brought low. They also took pride, and I think this is what fueled a lot of their pride or what they took pride in. They took pride in their formidable location their formidable location see edom has been described as a wild rugged mountainous and almost inaccessible land we'll see this in a moment it was uh, predominantly marked by red sandstone cliffs with deep ravines and some glens and flat terraces upon the uh, mountain parts that actually provided rich productive soil it was seemingly 
a, a very perfect location in the sense of, boy, no one can touch us. This is, this is we're, we're far above in these cliffs and these tops of the valleys. And no, no one's, it, it was very much viewed at sometimes in some ways impenetrable. This had caused them to become very prideful over it. They thought that no one could conquer us. No one would bring us down. Our, our cities are among the cliffs and the rock canyons. And uh, one of the, the great examples was their chief city of Petra. Okay. They had three, about three main cities to the, uh, the country of Edom, and, and uh, Petra was a city that was passed down to those who conquered them in, in future years. And it, 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 was, it was obviously by name, it was the rock. In fact, it's called the Red Rose City is what it's referred to, and it had the nickname at that time. And it was literally carved out of rock. Some of you have probably seen it. It's a famous uh, site in Jordan, and uh, one of the pr- uh, prominent places is uh, this locale. It's, uh, this is referred to as the treasury and things, uh, the uh, Nabidian Arabs that took over uh, this area of Jordan uh, that the Edomites once controlled. Uh, I'm not sure who carved this part into the rock, but nonetheless, this is where the Edomites live. This is Petra. This is their, uh, one of their main cities. And so these things are literally carved out of the rock. And so um, here's another picture of it. You can see more of the <laughs> surrounding landscape. You can understand why they took pride in saying, hey, this is an impenetrable area. No one's going to conquer us. How are they going to get in here and, and attack us in this, uh, in, in this way? And um, Actually, excuse me, that wasn't the treasury. Um, we'll get to the treasury in a moment. Um, that was called a main hall or something like that. Um, this is um, a catacombs. These are actually places of burial in the rock that they dug out and uh, probably at one time also served as homes and things like that. But uh, they, this is where they found remains and things just carved in the stone. I mean, literally really carved into the sandstone. This was, uh, yeah, that was the treasury here that you've seen, a famous thing and even used in some movies and things like that. Pretty interesting, I won't go into it, but the archaeological study of how that was actually built is quite fascinating. They actually started at the top, and as they created, as they created uh, uh, the, the cast-offs of the stone, it built up so they could stand on that to carve the rest of it. They'd move a little bit and use that kind of as their ladder, but to get to the top, there's some marks on either side. You can see they're pretty ingenious in their ability to, to carve it out, use some scaffolding and things like that. Nonetheless, carved from stone. Pretty amazing as you picture it. And so this was their city. This is, this is where they lived in this kind of area. And they literally thought what? No one can touch us. No one can touch us. You might remember it was <laughs> before the famous o- ocean liner, the Titanic, uh, set forth on its maiden voyage, fateful maiden voyage, that a passenger, Mrs. Albert Caldwell, was a little nervous. So she went up to one of the workers on the, the boat there, and she said, okay, is this, thing, is this thing really unsinkable? His response was simple. With a little chuckle, he said, God himself couldn't sink this ship. Well, we all know how that turned out, don't we? But I'll tell you, it's the same attitude we see here, isn't it? Did you catch what they said? Look at it again. Look at the verse, verse number 3. Who shall bring me down to the ground? Sounds like a challenge. Shows their heart. Who's going to touch us, man? We're touchable. We got this beautiful place. No one's going to attack us. Look at verse number four. Let's read that. Verse number four. Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy uh, thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. Woo, I love that statement. There's a famed approach to the city of Petra, and it has a couple different names. One of the names is the Valley of Moses. You see it here in the picture, also called the, uh, the Valley of El Sky, or literally the shaft is what that is too, by the way, uh, is what that means. But it affords great protection to the city. This is the main entrance into it. And uh, the passage is at places barely enough, as you can see and imagine, barely enough for two horsemen going next to each other. And because of that, um, you really think it's flanked by those tall sandstone cliffs and on either side. It, it, literally looking at it, most would agree, and a whole army could attack, and you could probably take a, a 12, a dozen determined men strategically placed, and they could never get in there. So, and, and humanly speaking, you're like, oh yeah, this is almost impenetrable. This is almost a, you can't do anything in. But then, uh, as he says, you, you think your nest is among the eagles and the stars. And what does God say? He says, listen, I'm the maker. I'm the maker of the stars and the eagles and the cliffs. I will bring you down. And your 
pride, your pri- proudful attitude, I-, I will bring you down. I will judge you for how you have acted, your heart's attitude and your, your spirit. He scoffs at their pride that has exalted them be, to the extent they don't, we're untouchable. No one's going to be able to do anything to us. And we're going to rejoice in what Israel has suffered. And, and God is going to bring them to judgment. Look at verses 5 and 6 quickly. Another great verse. If thieves came to thee, if robbers by night, how art thou cut off? And man, what an exclamation. He's saying, this is going to happen, my friend. This, you're going to be cut off. He goes on, would they not have stolen till they had enough? If the great gatherers came to thee, would they, would they not leave some grapes? Verse 6. How are the things of Esau searched out? Literally, his heart is revealed, his actions. How are his hidden things sought up? Okay, so letter D, and we'll explain the verse. It's a great verse. Letter D says this. They too would be plundered and spoiled. See, this brings to light one of the things they enjoyed as a, at their prime location. One of the things they took pride in was uh, their location when it came to commerce. Remember verse 14, we just studied it, or looked at it. Verse 14 talked about them being in the crossway. Well, Edom was strategically located where they st- were, were found next to se- several major trade routes in that day. Countries were trading back and forth all along these in the Middle East there. And they, they literally amassed, for such a small country, they amassed great wealth. Um, these, a, these countries, excuse me, would trade back and forth. And they were considered kind of the middlemen. These from the east would come and, and trade there in Petra and other cities. And then these from the west would come and, and they'd trade too. And so they were kind of that middleman. In fact, the, the Phoenicians and Arabs used the Edomites to, to uh, hold trade back and forth. And they were the middlemen for them. They set up custom agents, if you could describe it as such, on these trade routes. And so when wealthy merchants would come by, they would take a tax and take some of their wealth as payment to use that. And other times they would just send out men to, uh, to raid the caravans and retreat to the safety of their cliffs. So they became very rich. They had much wealth. In fact, the remains of Petra there, uh, I watched a documentary on it, and boy, they have found the underlines of a beautiful city, a great marketplace, a, a great fountains and so forth. Very picturesque of much wealth was present there in those cities at some point. And no doubt that certainly would, some of it would date back to the time of the Edomites. Very wealthy. But what is God telling them? God's telling them that they are going to be plundered and spoiled completely that's where this parable of the thieves and the the grape harvesters as i might describe the great gatherers comes into play he says this listen when a thief comes to your house does he go in and does he take the time to take everything or does he just take what he came in to get does he just come in and take what he can carry and he gets out Uh, those who harvest grapes don't they go down the vine and and just take uh, in other words they don't strip the vine completely they just take what what they need and what's ripe at that point they leave some other grapes and so forth he's asking a rhetorical question don't they do that because you know what edom when these invaders descend upon you, they are going to spoil you and plunder you completely. They're going to take everything. There's not going to be anything left. Uh, they're not going to be like the thief who only takes what is enough. They're not going to be like the grape gatherer who leaves something on the vine. No, no, no. They're going to take it all. You're going to be completely wasted. You see, you're going to be ransacked, destroyed. What did verse 10 say? You're going to be cut off forever. Nothing would be left, literally nothing. All would be carried off. The destruction would be complete and entire. Can I just put it this way? We're standing back and we're reading this about I don't know, Edom. We're like, whoa. You know what Edom has ca- crossed? We might call it the invisible line between God's uh, patient mercy and God's all-encompassing or all-consuming wrath. They crossed that line. God certainly has given them many, uh, many chances down through the ages of repenting, but they've held on to that bitterness, their anger. They've held on to it, and in their pride, they've refused to bow the knee to God Almighty, to Jehovah. And now, judgment day has come. Payday is here. The last verse speaks of her uh, actions being searched out, her hidden heart attitudes exposed and found out, and she will be weighed and found grossly wanting. These things have been discovered. They've been searched out. 
Look at verse number 8, if you will, with me. Verse number 8. Shall I not in that day, saith the Lord, even destroy thy wise men out of Edom, and understanding out of the mount of Esau? Letter E, they, would, they too would suffer destruction and slaughter. It has been said that Edom is a great type or picture of worldly wisdom along with its unbrotherly enmity uh, towards God's people. In fact, in that day, Edom had garnered a, t uh, a reputation for possessing worldly wisdom. They were known to be shrewd and, and wise when it came to the things of the world, the ways of the world. It's interesting, um, uh, Job's friend, Eliphaz, was from Teman, which is a city in Edom. And uh, he kind of presents to Job very much worldly wisdom as you think back on it. Um, uh, Herod, the, all the Herods in the, uh, the first century came from this. In fact, their, their father was from Edom. He was an Edomine and uh, from being from Edom, as we saw that term before. And all the Herods, and you remember what Christ called Herod at Antipas? He says, that fox. That wily and subtly, that, that guy who just, you know, and describing all the Herods are very much that, manipulating and very shrewd and, and so forth. And so the Edomites had this reputation and very much proud of that. They were, they were proud of the wisdom that they had um, and that they had a reputation for. And yet God said it would do them very little good in the face of this impending judgment. It's all going to be destroyed. Look at verse 9. And thy mighty men, O Teman, shall be dismayed. To the end that every one of the mount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. Every one. They were, Eden was no doubt just as proud of her wisdom as she was her mighty men. Yet God says all of them are going to be slaughtered in that day. Destruction and slaughter will be far encompassing. From Petra to Teman, uh, the whole nation will be brought under judgment. And what does he say? Be cut off. The very sources of their pride will be ripped away, leaving them nothing to take pride in. And isn't that what bitterness does? Just steals you of everything good and important, precious. It is believed that the Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar, Syrians, somewhere in there, that that really began the end of the Edomites. By the fourth century B.C., they had lost much of their land. Uh, as I had mentioned um, before, the N Nabataean uh, Arabs had taken over much, including Petra, at that point. And as far as can be determined. Um, we would say that there is no lasting Edomite nation. And by a nation, we mean culture, history, identifiable people. Any remnant has seemingly been assimilated into other nations beyond the first century A.D. In fact, some would say that the ransacking of Jerusalem and all that took place in that area really spelled the end and the doom, the completion of this prophecy for the nation of Edom. Okay? I'm not going to sit here and argue and say there's no seed left somewhere because the reality is the rest of this passage tells us in the day of the Lord, all the heathen are going to be taken care of, including any remnant of Edom. And we'll see that here in a moment. But I want you to see the reality is this prophecy has played out just as God says. They have reaped what they've sown. Now look at verses 15 and 16 quickly and we'll be done. Notice verses 15 and 16. For the day of the Lord is near upon the heathen. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. Verse 16. For as ye have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink and they shall swallow down. And they shall be as those they had, or excuse me, be as though they had not been. What do we have here? This last part, we're going to spend just, a, just about a minute or two on it. Uh, Roman number four, the coming judgment of all heathen nations. So now here at the end, we have a, a, a global warning, <laughs> if we could call it as such, and a comfort for Israel. The coming judgment of all heathen nations. He says this, and we read it in verse number 15. What Edom has done, every nation or many nations have done since their attitude and treatment of israel and then even today may i just put it this way their treatment of god's children is part of the judgment that the tribulation is going to be so not only of israel is god's chosen nation but there's also the reality of the treatment of the church that is taking place we see that described in revelation that much of the the judgment that will befall is also in their animosity and bitterness both to israel and to god's church he pronounces judgment upon these nations that act just like edom and he references the day of the Lord that's coming down the road. Uh, notice the, those principles we've already mentioned as far as you reap what you sow. God says it's going to return upon their head. So you see the picture? I think verse 16 is such a good picture. 
he's picturing this. Israel's been carried away. Jerusalem, the holy city, the holy mount is there. The Edomites come in, and they're celebrating and rejoicing over Israel being gone, and their brother, and you know, they, they, this, is the, this is the best day, and because, boy, they're destroyed and so forth, and he pictures them as drinking and toasting on the holy mount to Israel's demise. And then God says this, and do not miss it, because this is a great prophecy. He says, okay, heathen nations, you too will drink. Oh, yes, you'll drink, but you will drink the cup of my wrath. And you see the picture? He says, you're going to swallow it. You ever take medicine? You ever try to give a child medicine who doesn't want to take it? Come on, swallow, swallow. You know what he's saying here? You're going to swallow it. And then the outcome of that is what? You will be no more. The heathen will be cut off. That's literally the description in. And they shall be as though they had not been. It is an ominous prediction. And they will swallow down and they too will be cut off just like Edom was. They'll be destroyed and obliterated. And then comes the comfort for Israel. Verses 17 and following. Look at it. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance and there shall be holiness and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. Verse 18. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire and the house of Joseph a flame and the house of Esau for stubble and they shall be kindled for them and devour them. And there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau for the Lord hath spoken it. And they of the south, that's the south of Israel, uh, shall possess the mount of Esau. And they of the plain of the, they of the plain, the Philistines, and they shall possess the fields of Ephraim and the fields of Samaria, and Benjamin shall possess Gilead. And the captivity of this host of the children of Israel shall possess that of the Canaanites, even unto Zarephath. And the captivity of Jerusalem, which is in Sepharad. Now, that's an interesting statement. We don't have time to go into it, but some believe that's not an actual place, though it may be. Some believe it's just a word, and the word literally means separated. Literally, the Jews who have been separated around the world. And he's talking about the captivity of this host of Israel shall possess. They'll come back to the land. They shall possess the cities of the south. Verse 21. And Savior shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau. And the kingdom shall be the Lord. For the Jew reading the letter, you know what Obadiah is saying? And I like this. Maybe just, let me just put it in simple terms. Israel's day is coming. Israel's day is coming. All the land, the wealth of the neighbors will be theirs. Their ancient foes, we know this, Revelation tells us, their ancient foes are going to rise again. The Arabs that now hold the land of Esau and others, these are nations that hate Israel. We could go down the line, Iraq and Iran and, and Egypt, Syria, and uh, even Jordan. These folks hate and, uh, man, they despise Israel like Edom did. So God has said, in the day of the Lord, listen, that land is going to be theirs. He foresees the day when Israel will conquer all and take land. You say, when's that going to happen? Well, he tells us, doesn't he? The last statement of the last verse says what? The kingdom shall be the Lord. Aren't you thankful the millennial kingdom is coming? When Christ is going to sit upon the throne, Israel will spread over the land of her enemies. And verse 21 helps us imagine how that is. I like that statement. He says, saviors. That's a word that just means deliver or judge. And so it helps give us a picture. Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign on the throne in the millennial kingdom. As he does, there will be others, those who are ruling under him, those little deliverers, saviors as it's termed here, judges, who will spread out the kingdom and will rule for him. And he certainly promises that, that we'll, we'll rule with him. And so that's described here, how they'll spread out and rule the land. It's all encouraging because this is what happened. Remember, Edom rejoiced that Israel was devastated, destroyed, and that their day of destruction came. God is encouraging them this. Israel, your day's coming. You will have all this land. Your enemies will be defeated. They will be as though they have never been. Now here is a great encouragement for you and I. Before Israel's day comes, we're going to enjoy our day. The day when you and I reunite, reunited or united with our Savior and we'll join Him in heaven <laughs> to enjoy a time that is beyond our imagination. You know what that should do? That should encourage you and I as we deal with our own Edomites. 
people who despise us and, and maybe show us no pity, maybe those who don't like us just simply because we're God's children and because we're believers and because we hold to the truths of God's word. And, and you know what reality is, my friend? We know the last chapter and our day is coming, just as Israel did. And so you and I can handle a little bit of animosity. We can handle a little bit of bitterness. We can handle some people not treating us as we, they should and they ought because, my friend, our God keeps the books in heaven. And he'll take care of it. And so we'll look to him and we'll trust to him and you and I will obey and do as we ought to in the meantime.